It's nine o'clock. Let's call the meeting of. As soon as we get the attention of the administrator, we'll call the meeting to order. Special meeting of the Door County Board of Supervisors, Tuesday, August 23, 9 o'clock. We're on schedule. We're coming to you today from the multi purpose room at the Justice Center on South Duluth Avenue in Sturgeon Bay. So we'll call it to order, and I ask that you rise and join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I thank you, and the next item will be the roll call by the county clerk. Anderson. Present. Fosted. Here. Brand. Here. DeBaker. Here. DeWitt. Here. Fisher. Here. Fontaine. Here. Gunlickson. Here. Haynes. Here. Levy. Here. Lino. Here. Meyer. Miller. Here. Mullican. Here. Ninus. Here. Olson. Here. Runquist. Here. Schultz. Here. Burley. Here. Wiegand. Present. Zipper. Here. <laughs> How come I'm always last? Presentation of the agenda is next. We have a so moved from Paul and a second by Mr. Patrick Olson. Questions or comments? Mr. Meyer is also in attendance. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, the capital improvement program, information only, no action will be required. We're going to talk about the communications upgrade that has been in the hopper for a little while. And uh, also the Senior Resource Center later on. And the presentation today is going to be made by um, Tim Ullman, and I see also, uh, okay, Ann Demise, and we have, did I see Dickie Burris here too? Oh, ho, oh, oh, a crutch list, but a keen. <laughs> glad, glad you can keen. <laughs> Welcome back. All right, with that, uh, we'll lay out the agenda for today. And uh, if we pay attention to what's going on, um, he'll introduce the presenters and also a schedule, what we intend to follow. And if you came through the lot, of course, you saw whole bunch of rescue vehicles there, fire and rescue, and we hope that we don't have to see them leave. But. No, Tim, it's uh, all yours. Thank you, Leo. Um, um, thanks for coming today. <coughs> Will this be up on your little thingy here? It is available to you out on the website if you go out. How do you do that? Let's, can we go do out to the that? county board agenda. Okay. Your county board website, Mark's giving you a hot link to it. And there was some porting documentation. A PowerPoint is available to you for download. It's the last document on today's docket for 823. Okay. All right. Mark, you want to show them how to get it? Okay. But it is available to you. David can show you for download. So the slides that you have in here today are available out on the website, out at County Board. Um, but thanks for coming today. Again, as we talked, the last time we got together, we started to go through um, some of the projects in the CIP. And we started to talk about public safety having quite a few of those projects over the next five years. And so um, when we started to do that, um, we sat down with Mike and Shirley. And we started to discuss how we'd actually, in these tight economic times, move ahead with getting some of these projects for public safety funded. And that's basically what brought us here today, talking with Leo. Leo asked if he thought it would be a benefit to the rest of the county board to not only go through what we're looking at, at uh, putting in in the next five years, but actually go and be able to kick the tires, so to speak, today, 
and touch the technology, touch the hardware, see what it's about. And in order to do that, we brought you to the epicenter of the public safety system, okay, which is over here at the Justice Center. So today we're going to go through a couple of slides. We're going to talk about the history. We're going to talk about how we ended up here today. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about communications in Door County and what some of the weak points are and why we need to fix those weak points. We're going to talk about the fact that uh, dispatch, the Sheriff Dispatch Center, is the epicenter of our communications. Everything starts with dispatch in our communication system. We are going to take a tour of all the equipment going through the dispatch center. Then we're going to go into the computer room behind dispatch center, the MDF, the main distribution frame. We'll walk down the hallway, give you a bathroom break at the end of the hallway if you need it. We're going to walk out the end of the hallway over to the radio tower, the radio tower hut, and then from there we'll proceed into the parking lot and start with the ambulance. Okay? A for ambulance. That'll be the first stop on the tour today. Your last stop on the tour today will be the fire trucks. We have three different fire trucks. We'll probably break into some smaller groups. Again, I believe we have a southern door, a northern door, and a Sturgeon Bay fire truck out there. So for those of you who represent those districts, I would ask that you go and talk to those individuals on those fire trucks. Okay? Um, so we're going to break that down, and we're going to try to get you back in here by 10 to 10.30, and that will be a race. Okay? Secondarily, um, today it's open-ended. So as we go through this presentation, if you have a question, don't hesitate to ask it right away. If you wish, we'll come back in here. We'll close it back down after the tour, and we'll open it up for questions as well if you want to save it till the end. But while it's fresh in your mind, it might be best that you just ask it as we go along. Okay? Um, what I want you to understand is we have a spreadsheet in front of you today. It has a green line and a red line down at the bottom. Okay? And although we'll talk specifically a little bit today, about these 18 or 19 projects that are outlined in this, spreadsheet, uh, in this spreadsheet, I want you to understand that these figures are subject to change. Okay? Um, we have projects that are included in here for the 2012 through 2016 CIP, and you've gotten that booklet already. And so those projects were all put in that CIP. You've seen that. Um, some of these projects, although they don't look like they would fit within the CIP because they're $40,000, we want to make sure that you understand this is all part of the communication systems. These are subsets of the communication systems that we would have to come to you over the next five years and ask individually. And if you, if you really think about that and the timing of coming to those funding decisions, if you don't have that funding and we can't get the microwave to Bailey's Harbor, our system suffers. Okay, our constituents, the users of our system suffer. That is why we're here today to try to go after bonding the entire package so it is funded and we can get the technology out to our, our end users. So, the scope of the project can change based on your funding sources, technology, and future needs, and other possible collaborative arrangements we make with either local, state, or federal agencies or private sector businesses in Door County who can also augment our public safety system. So again, although we are here today on the 23rd of August, it is what we know today with these 19 projects. It is subject to change, okay? So with that in mind, here's the spreadsheet that we were talking about. It's in there. And I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this spreadsheet. Again, you're going to have another seven days to grind over these figures, what they mean. I would ask that you call us in the next seven days. Myself, Chris Hecht, Dick Burris, Ann Demise, Kerry Golson, Sheriff Vogel, and ask them, what does that mean to you if you have some questions on those 19 projects? Okay? But again, we're trying to bundle that together today for a bond of $2.1 million dollars over the next five years, okay, as far as project work. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, what do you mean by some are mandated, some are not? Mandated means, for instance, and we'll get into this today, narrow banding is a federal mandate. We have to take our radio system and narrow band it over the next five or ten years. We've got to do it twice. And as a result of those federal mandates, by the way, unfunded from the feds in many cases, we have to take care of that. 
okay? As a county, you're responsible for maintaining this system, okay? Not everybody understands narrow banding. Narrow banding is basically taking a frequency, let's just say that it can handle, um, it's a 64K channel now, you're actually putting two channels in that same 64K. So now it gets divided in 32. And we have a couple of slides in this today that'll talk about narrow banding. And Chris can go into the details of that a little better than I. So um, I was amiss. I started without introducing. This is Ann Demise from Emergency Management. Carrie Coulson from uh, Supervisor of Dispatch. Chris Hecht works for you. He's an EMS and he's the Fire Chief, Sister Bay. And you have a whole plethora of public safety folks in the back row. I hope that you know some of them from your districts, okay? And we'll meet them all as we go out on the tour. My bad. So, uh, to talk about communications history. <laughs> we got them. All right. Is that a gun in his pocket? That was in 1998 when I retired. That wasn't too long ago then. I don't know if he's going in the cell or not. No, I'm just kidding. But back in the day when we had communications, it was a much smaller deal. And, and you could handle it with just a couple of people and a couple of radios. And uh, those, those radios could talk from north to south, east to west in our county. Um, and it didn't do a very good job of it. Okay. All of you understand the geography of Door County and its, its inherent problems as far as getting signaling. I struggle with it with wired connections trying to get fiber from north to south, okay? But the other thing about our geography that you have to understand in our public safety system, and you will hear later today, we have all the geographic regions of the waters of Lake Michigan and the Bay, and the Bay of Green Bay to cover as well for water rescue. So it's not just your land borders you're worried about here. And you'll see in a future slide as well, all the different agencies we have to be interoperable with. And it's very, very uh, integrated system, highly integrated system, okay? I want you to understand that we continue to look for cooperative partnerships throughout with our, commu with our communication systems. When we started looking at the Southwest Tower build down along the four-lane corridor, uh, we started to look for um, cooperative arrangements with Brown County and Kiwani County. It does look like Kiwani County is ready to go with us on a tower build in Southwest. Um, and that is a huge savings to us. It splits our tower costs hopefully roughly in half versus us taking on that entire build by ourselves. As you know, the communication system, the CATS Communication Advisory Technical Subcommittee meets roughly every two months to discuss what our priorities and what are our, our, our uh, maintenance and what other things that we need to do over the next five years to keep the system up and operable. So at that point in CATS, we have most of our users of the system come and they either come up with whatever complaints or problems we have with the systems and we start to actually brainstorm how we're actually going to make the system work. Okay? CATS is an advisory committee used to advise law enforcement. Um, I wanted to let you know that within the last year, we have put CATS underneath IS. So they are now responsible to the IS committee. A couple of reasons for that is because of the, the major move from analog or older systems to an IP system. If you didn't already know, our, our microwave back, backhaul is already all IP. We basically take all of our analog communications, convert it to an IP packet, and bring it back here to the Justice Center on those microwave links. That was the first reason. The other reason is the technology in the vehicles, the technology on the individuals, everything is going IP. So everything that they're capturing out in the field is going to uh, a digital packet. The other reason that we thought about this, and again this was discussion with Leo and Mike, is 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 a neutral public safety department. In other words, do I drive around in polyester brown and carry a 9mm? Some days I wish I could, but I don't. I'm neutral. In other words, I don't I'm not affiliated with the Sturgeon Bay PD. I'm not affiliated with the Sturgeon Bay Fire Department, Sister Bay Fire Department. I'm neutral. So as the requirements come into CATS, okay, no one gets more priority than anyone else. Okay? And so as we looked at that, we thought that that would be the right way to go. You also have, um, in the near future, our one-legged cane man, now he's walking on level ground. If most of you didn't know, our history of the communication system is soon to leave 
or walk out the door. I hope he acts as an advisory member in the future, but um, Dick Burris had kind of, we sat down and talked this through for many, many uh, coffees, and uh, we decided this was probably the right thing to do. If you want to ask him about it, please feel free to do so. Okay? I'm going to turn it over to Chris and Carrie, and I'll see you back when we're ready to go on the tour. Thank you, Tim. I'm speaking to you today, um, as you know, I'm a paramedic for the county and the fire chief for Sister Bay, but I'm speaking to you today as an end user of the radio. Typically, in my day-to-day -day work operation, my volunteer fire department operation, I use the radio a lot, so I'm here to speak as an end user. Door County is a little bit unique. The county board has decided to do a county-wide radio system. Many counties are moving towards that, or multi-county radio systems. Many counties have a county-wide answering point, and then the 911 call takers then shift the incoming call to the appropriate agency for dispatch. The county here has brought it all under one roof, and that roof is the county board. And as Tim alluded to, the county board has the responsibility for that system and the ability for that system to be used by the end user. We talk about a communication system. It starts in the field. It starts with somebody who picks up the phone and dials 911. They are now part of the communication system. If that call can't go through, that's our problem. And that system extends all the way through the microwaves and the, and the radios to dispatch and then back out to the end user. Again, an end user, me or Tim or one of the fire departments, EMS, who takes the call and then responds to that caller. That is the system that you are responsible for. Okay? It is your responsibility or the county's responsibility to maintain that system, to make sure that it works appropriately, and to keep it moving forward with technology. It's important to understand that any change to the system, good or bad, affects all players. We take something out of the system or we add to the system. It's just not the sheriff's department or the police department. It affects every fire department, every first responder group, the ambulances, the police departments, and then the sub-agencies that we don't use as much, maybe the DNR or the state patrol. Okay? The communication system is the key to interoperability. It is the only way that me and Sister Bay Fire Department could talk to Tim Hurlash and the Sturgeon Bay Fire Department is the communications interoperability. The key to that system is dispatch. Everything goes through dispatch. Every 911 call, every administrative line, everything comes through dispatch. If dispatch can't handle the information, if they can't receive the information and give the information back out, the system fails. Okay? That is the key. Okay? Carrie's going to talk a little bit about the dispatch component and how key it is to the system working and the movement of the information back and forth. All right. Again, my name is Carrie Gosen. I am the supervisor for the 911 Center and I'm also a dispatcher. Uh, today I'm going to give you just a little brief, I guess, dispatch 101. Um, basically, in a nutshell, what a dispatcher's job is, every single phone call that comes into the dispatch center, we either resolve it or refer it. So whether it's a phone call coming in and they want to know where do I go to get a uh, temporary license plate to I'm um, coming up on vacation and are the cherry blossoms in bloom, seriously, we do get that phone call, to something that makes the newspaper, like our um, standoff in the city that we just had with a man with a gun. So everything that happens in this county comes through dispatch first. So, and dispatch, as you notice, is basically the hub, the hub of the wheel, so to speak. Um, so dispatch is responsible for all of the entities that you see. It isn't just law enforcement, but the law enforcement agencies would be the Sheriff's Department, Sturgeon Bay PD, also the CSOs, which are the Community Service Officers, Washington Island PD, the Constables, um, all of the EMS groups, so all of the EMRs, all of the ambulances, emergency management, and all of the fire departments in the county. So, and with that, Every entity has their own procedure and protocol. So there's so many things that go on with a, simple, with a simple phone call. So I'll give you an example of how one phone call can incorporate a number of those agencies all at the same time. So I'll give you an example of a personal injury accident. Okay, we call it a PI accident. Um, let's say it happens at a high profile location. First of all, we're dealing with all the 911 calls. And everybody knows everybody's got a cell phone, so we don't get just one. We probably get 15 to 20. 
Then what we'll do is once we get that location, we're going to dispatch the EMR group, the ambulance group, and depending on protocol, it could be two ambulances for that location, the fire department group, and also the law enforcement agency for that area. Now, mind you, there could be up to 25 people talking all at the same time on three separate frequencies into dispatch. And that's just the one incident. Life doesn't stop. So we have that one incident that we're dealing with and everything else that's going on in the county. So I do have a little um, audio for you to listen to. But the one thing that I also want you to keep in mind is everything that you hear today and everything that you see today there are only 11 of us that do this in the county. So I just want you to keep that in mind. So um, to kind of preface our audio, to give you just a small example of how life can change in dispatch in an instant, this audio is from July 30th. I don't know if you guys remember that day. That day I was working a 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. shift. Beautiful, beautiful Saturday. Um, in fact, during the day shift, one of the um, county deputy said he swears there were 500 boats out at Chambers Island. That's how beautiful of a day it was. Well, then we got a little storm still that came through. So, and you're only going to listen to about a minute of information. Now, when you listen to that minute of information, that went on in the dispatch center for a good two hours. So, what you're going to hear is, first of all, we already had a report of two boats with four people on board in each boat in distress about five miles out from Haynes Beach. Also, you're going to hear tones because my partner is paging out um, a fire department for a 20-foot boat with five people on board that's in distress. I'm attempting to contact the Coast Guard to let them know of all the, the water rescues that we knew of at that time. Um, Bug Fire Department is actually calling into dispatch on the fire frequency about a wagon that's overturned, partially blocking an intersection. I'm also taking another call of a fishing boat that's in distress. This is up in the Gibraltar area, I believe. And also the first phone calls are starting to come in. We had a large tree that took power lines down, now mind you, on State Highway 42 in July at 4.30 in the afternoon on fire in front of the English Inn just north of Fish Creek. So um, that's everything that's happening in that minute of information that you're going to hear. And you're going to hear the phone conversations, the radio conversations, you're going to hear tones. You're also going to hear kind of a shrill um, ringing in the background. That are, those are all the other 911 calls coming in. So hopefully you'll be able to hear all of that and maybe pick out all of those incidents that are happening at that time. Thank you, Carrie. I'm going to speak a little bit about some of the deficiencies in the communication system um, in Door County. And what we hope to do is that, that this bond issue that we're talking about today is going to address some, probably not all, of the deficiencies within the communications in the county. Ideally, we'd like to say that a police officer, a fireman, paramedic anywhere in the county could be able to contact dispatch on their radio 100 percent coverage 
Is it possible? Absolutely it's possible. Technically it's possible. Financially, it's just the cost benefit isn't there. Okay? So what do we want to get to or what do we strive to get to? The national standard for communications is 95-95. You should be able to receive 95% of a transmission 95% of the time when you're inside a typical residential style building with a portable on your hip. Okay? 95% of the transmission, 95% of the time. We're not there. I think all the public safety people in the back of the room could attest to you that we're not even close to this. This would be our goal. Will this get us there? Probably not. Will it get us much closer than we are today? Yes. Okay. That's the goal. This is Door County's communication system as it stands today. The photos on the outside represent our current tower sites. This map is here for you to take a look at after the tour or after your meeting today. And certainly, as Tim mentioned, if you have questions, ask them. If you have questions after the meeting, please ask them. These represent our current tower sites. Um, as Tim alluded to, we're very fortunate in Door County. We own very few of these tower sites. We maintain very few of these tower sites. We have great collaboration with other public entities and private or corporate entities that have allowed us to build the system out to where it is today with minimal funding. Some of the issues we continue to have, we have significant coverage issues in the south end of the county. You're going to hear a couple of incidents or a couple of people talk about that here shortly. Significant coverage is here. Significant coverage issues in the Bailey's Harbor through to Fish Creek in the North Egg Harbor area. Okay? Where we simply cannot talk back to dispatch on a portable and we have a lot of trouble receiving pages. This proposal addresses most of those issues. We have microwave communications throughout the county. We have multiple short links or short hops using unlicensed microwaves. Part of the bond issue is to move us to a microwave frequency that is licensed. Okay? The unlicensed microwave systems that we have in the county are susceptible to interference from other users. Just like it's unlicensed for us, it's unlicensed for them. We had an incident about two years ago where somebody put a microwave up that ran relatively parallel to our microwave on Washington Island. It took the entire county communication system down countywide, police, fire, and EMS. Okay? Their interference brought our entire system down. Luckily, the individual that had done that realized what they had done and offered to move their frequency further away from us, allowing our system to come back online. Again, it goes to that cooperation that the county has with other entities. But there's nothing saying that they had to move. Okay? We have those hops throughout the county. One of our plans is to migrate off of those to protect ourselves a little bit. Okay? Good. We're going to hear from initially a, a audio video clip from Caleb Whitney, who is the um, Bailey's Harbor Assistant Fire Chief, talking about some of the issues that they have in Bailey's Harbor. Then we're going to hear from a couple people here in the audience. Aaron, can you hear me back or not? Up a little. We have consistent problems with our handheld radios in particular. The cottage fire early this, this summer and had a great deal of difficulty communicating even though we were off, obviously all within a short distance. We have consistent problems communicating with Gibraltar fire, especially as we get into the area of County A. And we have fairly large dead zones out of our County Q. We've also had such inconsistent paging that we moved more personally subsidizing the paging system by utilizing an e-dispatch which comes to texts on our cell phones. That's a way to guarantee that we actually get the pages that we need. My name is Caleb Whitney, the Assistant Fire Chief. Okay, Caleb talks about a couple things there. He's problems receiving pages and his problems talking. One of the things he alludes to is a backup system called e-dispatch. The fire departments across the county and the county has participated in it as well have put in a system that listens like a pager does, receives the information, and then runs it through your cell phones. It is, um, it is not dependable enough to be, an alternative, to be a dependable alternative to the pager. They market it as an adjunct, and they're quite specific that you cannot use it for emergency dispatch. But it has, it has covered some of those dead zones where pages are missed. 
Kurt Vanderties here. He's the fire chief for Brussels Union Gardner Fire Department. He'll speak to you briefly about some of the issues that he's had in the southern end of the county. Right. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, in addition to being the fire chief, I'm also an emergency medical responder for the town of Brussels Union Group. And we routinely have uh, difficulties, especially in the south end of the county. A um, couple of examples that come to mind, whether we're responding to emergency vehicle um, accidents or motor vehicle accidents, uh, medical calls or fires. Um, I recall a fire that we had on Chapel Lane, which is on the south end of the county, and uh, we didn't know if there was anyone inside. We had crews going in for search and rescue, but we couldn't communicate. Our crew members that were inside that house couldn't communicate to the engine that was literally right on scene 100 feet away. Uh, whether responding to medical calls, uh, we're not able to give information to the responding ambulance because we're not able to get out on our portables. The south end of the county, particularly um, right off the county line, is a very difficult area. We also have areas in the township of Gardner, um, primarily along the water shore, where we've had calls, whether they're water rescue calls or fire calls in front of the residential homes, we're not able to communicate out with our portables. It makes it very difficult, um, especially when you do have people going inside of a building that they can't communicate to the people outside. So um, if you have any questions today, I'll be outside and available to answer any of those that you might have. Thank you, Kurt. One thing to make note of is that the area that Kurt talks about is essentially the gateway to Door County. The amount of traffic, the tourists that come through there, in excess of a million people <coughs> travel those stretches of roadways where he cannot communicate to an ambulance, dispatch, or anybody else. Okay, that is the gateway to Door County. Okay. Next we have uh, Officer Paul Cadell who would like to speak about a specific incident that happened to him down in that same area. <coughs> I don't know if you remember the call back in April. 27th of 2008, I responded to a strong armed robbery that occurred on Breezy Acres in the Town and Union. Um, I was responding from the Forestville area. My backup officer was responding from uh, Institute. Unfortunately, Trooper Jenny Austin was uh, in the area and on scene um, shortly afterwards to uh, back me up. Um, on arrival at the scene, uh, the perpetrators had left. Um, we, we dealt with an injured lady that had been struck in the head with a, a pistol. Uh, we did a pre perimeter search and a search of the residence. Um, and then the investigation uh, started. I needed resources. Uh, as soon as I left my squad car, my portable was gone. I lost all communications. Um, I didn't realize this, but while Bob Water was en route, they had a su suicidal subject with a knife at the Brussels General Store which he responded to with backup. Um, at that time, you know, notifying supervisors, getting investigations down there for the crime scene, that all broke down. So any communication, I would have to go back to my squad car and physically get in the car and, and, and use. We had ambulance on scene. Um, there were interviews to be done. There was a cursory search of the neighborhood. There was uh, potential witnesses to talk to. And the communications made that whole situation a lot more difficult. Thank you, Paul. And what he alludes there to there, <coughs> two significant incidents going on in the same type of area is kind of what Kerry talked about. Life doesn't stop. Just because there's one significant incident going on, we have other things. Now, Paul didn't even know that second incident was going on. We're going to speak briefly about narrow banding. Um, we're not going to get too technical on it. Essentially, narrow banding is a federal mandate, that, and the feds basically said all frequencies must narrow band. And narrow banding is you're taking an existing bandwidth or highway, whatever you want to look at it, and you're going to cut it in half or make it narrower. And you're going to force all communication that's on that frequency or driving down that highway narrower. The bottom line is we have too many users and not enough frequencies. So what's the best way to get more frequencies? Tighten up or shrink the ones that are there. Okay? Mandated. We must be done with our narrow banding uh, January 1st of 2013. York County has been fairly fortunate. Uh, several years ago, the fire departments uh, applied for and got about an $800,000 grant. The county board participated in some upgrades to that grant. That grant paid for our initial round of narrow banding. Our three primary frequencies are already narrow banded and have been operating successfully for several years. Police, fire, and EMS are done. In the fall of next year, we plan to narrow band all the rest of the frequencies. So parks, highway, 
the alarm system, school buses, emergency government frequencies, all of that work still needs to happen. The cost associated with some of those upgrades to that equipment and the fact that all of the radios, every radio in Door County, police, fire, EMS, all have to be touched and reprogrammed again because we're narrow banded. Okay? Federal mandate. The bond issue covers some of or all of those costs. Okay? The, the required replacement of the equipment and the touching or reprogramming of the radios. So again, we touched on this. Who's required to narrow band? Everybody is. Every frequency has to narrow band. When is it required? January 1st of 2013. We're pretty far ahead of the curve compared to some counties, but we do still have some work and some costs associated with that. We have equipment that is not capable of doing this and must be replaced. Okay. One of the other things that's in the dispatch or in the bond issue to talk about being replaced is the Orbicon. Just like we talked about dispatch being the key component in our communication system, Orbicom, or the Orbicom system, is the key component that allows that to happen. The Orbicom system handles all of the day-to-day -day radio traffic. So if I talk to dispatch or dispatch talks to me, it goes through Orbicom. Any pages and information sent to the field goes through Orbicom. Okay? It allows us to communicate. Okay? Jason's here um, from Bay Electronics to speak briefly about the, the Orbicom and why it needs to be replaced. Uh, Jason's in charge of the maintenance of the county systems and his company is, and he can answer questions if you have any specific to the Orbicon. Thank you, Jason. It's Chris, I'm Jason Bowen with Bay Electronics, the radio maintenance provider for the county. The Orbicom dispatching system was originally installed when the first upgrade to the dispatch center happened in a rough, roughly 1997-1998 time frame. When the new dispatch was opened in 2005, the mainframe from the system was moved over. The client computers, screens were all updated at that point. Approximately two to three years ago, Orbicon was purchased by another company called Positron. Positron has since then has discontinued all of the Orbicon line. So Orbicon is at end of life now. So there are no replacement parts available for it through Orbicon anymore. No upgrades available for it through, anymore through Orbicon. When Bay Electronics found out that Orbicom was actually being discontinued at end of life, we actually went out and purchased an identical system that Door County has. So we could continue to maintain the system that Door County has as part of our agreement with them on the maintenance contract. However, we've started to use some of those pieces and our stock of what we had left is now starting to be depleted as well. So there may come a time when we won't have parts available to replace a part that goes is defective in the current system. The current system also is not capable of going to digital communications, isn't capable of doing trunking, so there are many limitations to what the system can do today and where the future of the communication system in Door County will be going. Thank you, Jason. Questions for Jason while he's up here? Thank you. So, any questions in general at all? Okay. Let me just go back through this little bit of a tour. Again, we would ask at this time that only the 21 supervisors go with us on this tour. We're going to have some pretty tight quarters. We're going to start in the dispatch center, and that will be the first stop. And if Carrie sees a call come in, she's going to raise her hand. If you see Carrie Gosen with her hand raised, you need to go immediately quiet because all of that background noise goes into the call. Okay, so the guys with the headsets on have to be able to hear what's going on in the call. But Carrie's going to walk you through the dispatch center, show you a little bit about what it's about. If there's no call, then we're just going to back you off and go into the MDF where the radio equipment, the E911 switch, and all of the uh, technical stuff is. We're going to walk down the hallway, and as we walk down the hallway, there's some bathrooms on the right side. If you need to take a, a quick bathroom break, jump on in there. We're going to walk out the end of the hallway and go out to the radio tower and show you that here and what comprises a radio tower, radio tower hut. And from there, we will go to the ambulance first. Okay? All right? So, um, with that in mind, we're going to go out the door by Sheriff Vogel and go down the hallway to the MDF. Okay, if there's anybody else that wants to come in here, I just want you to be able to see the screens. 
all, all four positions are set up identical. So if you want to come in, so you can take I'm a seat. I'm so you can take a look at or what I'm talking about. Oh, oh. You do. You do a lot. Is everybody in here? Yep. Everybody able to see? All right. Um, first, I'll introduce the dispatchers today. John Doyle, he's over on the left-hand side. And Diane Crone is over on my right-hand side. Um, and just kind of, I'm going to give you a really, really, really brief dispatch, 90, uh, dispatch 101 here. We've got, okay, hang on one sec, radio traffic. Okay, uh, we have four positions. All four positions can do exactly the same thing. Also, the ergonomically correct, so we can stand and we can sit. I'm a stander when I dispatch because I like to pace. Um, so we've got six six screens, two keyboards, and three mice that we deal with on a daily basis. All the screens are exactly the same except for in Diane's position. That top left screen that you see is a gray screen. That is our alarm computer screen. So what that alarm computer monitors is in the government center we've got panic buttons in all of the offices. So if, uh, if someone in social services has someone that's causing a problem, they push that panic button. We get an alarm in dispatch stating where that office is, the callback number, if there's a specific entrance they should use to get, in to get into that office. The other things that are monitored on that alarm computer are the tower sites. So all of our tower sites that we do have um, would be monitored for if the door is opened, if it gets too warm, because the, the temperature has to stay within a certain uh, degrees, otherwise it'll start to fry all the equipment. Um, also, the Sunny Slope Tower has a light at the top. If that tower light goes out, we get an alarm because we have to notify the FAA and let them know that there is no tower light any longer, so they have to let all the planes that are doing flight plans know they have to avoid that area so nobody hits our tower. Um, and actually, I guess uh, back in like 1988, someone did hit one of the towers uh, down on Geyer Road and uh, unfortunately was killed. But So uh, that's why we need to make sure that that information gets out. Um, I'll just go through all the screens that we have. Um, if you notice, the other three screens, I'll just go left to right. This left screen with all these little colored boxes, that's really all that is is our schedule soft. All the county deputies, the jailers, administration, dispatch, everybody is on that screen. So every day we look at it and we know who's working, if someone's on training, if someone is out sick. Um, and this is important so that when the oncoming shift comes in, if, if they're assigning someone to a zone and they're not there, then we need to tell them why. So that's, that's really their resource to make sure of uh, what kind of staffing levels they have. This top middle screen that we have, that's called our time system. And what we do on the time system is that's where we run our 27s and 28s, which are, if you're getting pulled over on a traffic stop, they'll run your license plate, they'll run your person information. Also, this is the screen that we enter warrants, restraining orders. Um, we can even enter body parts, which I think is kind of cool, but kind of creepy. But we can, there's so many different things that we can do with the time system. Also, um, airplanes, immigration, um, even if we need to know the fax number for LAPD, we can find it using the time system. So it's a pretty awesome tool. Um, if you notice on the top right screen, that's our CAD mapping screen. Uh, right now, there isn't, a, there isn't anything going on, but that screen was actually, we, we got that information through a grant that I had written quite some time ago. Um, but what that screen does is when we have a call that, that it, as long as it has an XY coordinate, it will populate on that screen. So if we have someone's address, and it's a valid address, it'll populate on that screen and we'll be able to zoom in, and we can actually look at orthophotography that was done and overlook that house. So, which is helpful especially um, for warrant service, um, or if they're looking for someone, if there's a lot of outbuildings, it's nice to be able to zoom in and let every, all the responders know what they're looking at. Um, phone call, so we'll hang on one sec. Carrie, you can go ahead. Okay. All right. 
Um, also, another thing to keep in mind too, um, we use that screen for XY coordinates with cell phones. So if people are under the misunderstanding that when you dial 911 on your cell phone, automatically we get a pop, uh, the screen populates and we know your location. That's not true. What we have to do is we have uh, what's called latitude and longitude <coughs> that we will enter and then it will populate. Um, it's usually relatively accurate. We have actually found people using that. Uh, in fact, one incident in the city, uh, a gentleman had a motorcycle accident and he was pinned under it and that's how we actually located him. He had no idea where he was. It's also not always 100% accurate, but it's pretty darn close. Um, now we'll go to the bottom screens. This bottom left, this is the Orbicom that we had talked about, our radio screen. Now if you notice all of these boxes, there's one box that'll be highlighted in green. If you notice, John and Diane have headsets on. So that is what we're gonna hear in our ear. So generally, we'll keep it on sheriff because that's the main frequency. But let's say we have an ambulance call. One of us will switch to EMS, and that's what we'll hear on our ear. So that's our main frequency. The frequency is that we listen to our sheriff, EMS, fire. And now, okay, you may ask, okay, where do you hear all the rest of them? Well, we hear the one in green in our ear. All the rest of them... Hang on. Okay. All the rest of them come through a speaker back here and these speakers. So that's the key component for a dispatcher. You have to be able to multitask. You're going to be taking a phone call in your ear, typing your information in your computer, and also listening to the other traffic that's going on. So it's, it's uh, multitasking is the, the key component to be a good dispatcher. So I'll show you the rest of the screens. We have Sheriff, EMS, Fire, Whispern, which is a state mutual aid channel, point to point, which is uh, like a state channel. We talk to generally Brown County and Kiwani County on a pretty regular basis on point to point. Sturgeon Bay Fire, so Sturgeon Bay Fire and EMRs come over that, the jail system, the highway repeater, emergency management, that's actually a frequency that's in all the school buses now. So let's say we have another incident like in Ellison Bay and we need to move. Are you still okay, Dan? Yeah. If we have to move a large amount of people, we could contact all the school buses, have them go to that frequency, and then we could coordinate where people need to be picked up and where they need to go. So that's what the significance of that one. Also the fire attack repeater. Um, with that fire grant, we were able to put the um, fire system on a microwave. We kept the fire attack repeater. So let's say we have a large structure fire and the fill sites are a long ways away. Um, we kept that so that the fire trucks could actually talk to each other. With a tactical frequency, it, it has a very short span of where you can talk and where you can listen. This gives them a, a, big, a better range. So if they do have a large structure fire, lots of fill sites all over, they still can communicate. Um, the next screen on here is our paging screen. Um, hey John, can you put paging screen up on that back corner? or that back computer. Pa yeah, if you could put paging screen just so those that are over there can see it. Um, okay, the paging screen are all those colored boxes. When we page out, of, there's uh, all of the icons on there represent fire departments. Uh, we have special icons for mutual aid fire departments. So if we have a large structure fire, we hit the mutual aid button and it notifies more than one fire department at the same time. And we have a specific procedure for that. Uh, all the green ones are all the ambulance services. Um, 650 is the central ambulance, 680 is the north ambulance, 670 the ambulance down in Brussels. All the blue buttons are all the EMR groups. The red, these darker weather alert tones, if we, weather is probably our most challenging event that happens in here. If we have a weather warning, so like a tornado warning or a um, severe thunderstorm warning, we use those tones and it will, it will page out everybody that happens to be on that tower, EMS group, fire department group, EMR group. So we can get that message out to as many people as quickly as possible. Um, also, we set off the tornado sirens in Forestville and in Sturgeon Bay. Now, the third screen that we have is called our Knox Box. Um, and what the Knox Box is, it, it's they're in specific fire trucks, and basically what they are, and if I say it wrong, Chris, please <laughs> please uh, uh, correct me, but basically what the Knox box is, is they have like a master key inside. Um, 
and what's that, what that is used for is especially like a, the complexes in Sturgeon Bay that have older people in them. Rather than in the middle of the night when someone falls down and needs help assistance getting up, they don't have to break the door down. They will say, can you release our Knox box? Dispatch does a page, releases the Knox box, that gives them the ability to take out the key and unlock the building without doing any damage. So, and that's all documented, so whenever they say release our Knox box, we document that in their radio history. So those are all the screens just on the Orbicom. That's why that's so important, because like Chris said, that's our radio, that's our paging, our Knox boxes. Okay. Okay, our next screen, this is our CAD screen. Oh, hang on one sec. Okay, um, unfortunately right now there's not a whole lot going on, I guess which is good for the tour, but it doesn't really show you a whole lot. Um, this top section is would be any calls that are happening at that point in time. The middle section is anything that is pending that hasn't been dispatched out. And this bottom section is everybody that's on duty at this particular point in time, their status and what they're doing, okay? Um, and I'll just show you the next screen that we use. This will be, whoop. Okay, this is called our, our CAD screen. So any call that comes in here, whether it's law enforcement related, EMS related, <laughs> fire related, this is all the information that we have to fill out on this screen. I'll just give you a little example. Um, here's one, someone had chest pain, here's the address, here's the complainant, any additional information on there. Um, and then also what we do is, and I can show you kind of the way we used to do it. So, and mind you, every system that we have here, we have at least one, two, possibly three backup systems in case something fails. Um, and, oh, that one. Okay, here's a, uh, then if we look at their radio history, that's just the radio history for that specific call. So anything that anybody says, we type into that computer and that is, cr that is their radio history. That's how that is created. In the olden days, this screen right here, you re well, you remember some of this, Biz. Yeah. Okay. Some of it we used to enter on a piece of paper. And we would have to enter the EMS group, the first responder group, the fire department group. All of that was hand entered. And this radio history that I showed you, every single deputy had a card. And we have an old antique little punch clock that we still have to use on occasion. We don't like to, but we do. So each person was given a card. You punch it, it date and time stamps it, and you write all that information down. So we've, and this wasn't all that long ago. I trained on this stuff. And I've been here since 1997. So that's how much things have changed over the course of a few years. And Biz, you probably have even better stories. <laughs> so. so that is our CAD system in a nutshell. And also, this system and this system work together. So if there's something entered here, it's going to populate over there. Okay? And I could show you all kinds of cool stuff that that does because I love maps, but I won't, I won't take up your time today. Last but not least, this, right, this screen on the right-hand side, this is our telephone. That was pretty hard for a lot of us old-timers to get used to, using a, phone, a computer on the phone. So, um, I don't know if I have any history. Um, if you notice in Diane's position, this area right here, whenever we get a... Um, this is the infer in this upper left part of that box. When someone calls on 911, if it comes on a landline or it comes on a cell phone that gives us X Y coordinates, this is the inf this is the box that will be populated. Um, when it's a landline, it'll give us the call the homeowner's name, their address, their telephone number, and that's the information that comes on that screen. If it's a cell call, it'll tell us let's say Cellcom, and it'll give us the telephone number, but then we would open up a little box here with details 
and if you notice there's a spot for lat, for lat and long XY coordinates. So that's where we find those XY coordinates. They just, um, they're not actually part of this call. We have to go to a, another screen to get those. Um, we got to keep them rolling. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and I guess that we have uh, 911 cell, 911 bank alarms, emergency notifications, and this is basically our Rolodex. So if we need to look up a phone number, we can right click on that, and uh, it's basically a Rolodex in a nutshell that's entered all in that back room, which you are going to next, right? Yep. Let's jump back in. Okay, you. you're welcome. Keep sorting right all the way in, guys, so everybody can get in. For those of you that have been with us long enough, you recall working with Leo and me way back in 2002 to get this room uh, designed. Um, one of the things that you have to understand with your dispatch and your communications is it is a 24 by 7 operation, 365 days a year. All right? So we take that very seriously. You will notice that this room is located on the center of the building. Okay? It is not on the exterior. There is no windows to this room. I barely, rarely allow video cameras in this room, okay? Because it's a secure room. It carries a lot of secure information. What you see in here is a data center room with all raised flooring. It goes all the way through the dispatch. All of our wiring is underground to those PCs. But all those PCs are out there as a window to the servers that are located in this room and all that phone gear that you see behind you to get to their 911 information. This whole side of the room is dedicated to the radio system and all of the dispatching that goes on with the radio and Orbicom system and how they communicate with their various towers, okay? Bottom line in this, this has also got 24 strands of fiber run out to the tower we're gonna go to next. It's got 24 strands of fiber going over to the highway shop and over to our other data center for backup. And the Justice Center and the way you designed it way back and built it in 2005, this room that room and the room that you're meeting in today become the emergency operations center. So if a tornado rolls through Door County and Demise and emergency management will set up an emergency ops center right in that room. All of this technology in this room literally is millions of dollars of investment. Okay? It's minuscule, minuscule to what the expectation of the constituent is. No one that travels to our county, let alone our tax paying constituents, want to hear that they cannot place a 911 call. Okay? This is what provides it. Behind you is the AT&T Positron E911 system. You see all of AT&T's D marks coming in. This is a highly specialized piece of equipment that costs $200,000, dollars when we initially bought it. This is the piece of equipment that is no longer being maintained. Okay, this Positron is end of life 2012. So that's why in 2014, 2015, we're looking to replace it. Behind you, the black cabinets are basically PC servers, file servers, etc. Behind Holly is all of our networking gear, which interconnects all of this stuff. And again, here's the radio system. If Jason wants to expand on it a little bit about the parts and components of it, I have to admit, when I designed this room, I didn't expect my radio guys to be in here, but that's that's cool. This we got them in here. This is the Orbicon mainframe that I spoke about that is now at end of life or end of life a few years ago, actually. So this is the central processing unit for all of the radio dispatch and paging that's out in dispatch. And then what we have here is several different what we call control stations. The system's now controlled via microwave. If that microwave would ever go down for any particular reasons, these control stations continue to talk with the base stations at all in the field so communications can continue to happen if we would have a microwave failure. It's just another form of redundancy. Thanks, Chase. One of the things that you'll note when we when we look at replacing this system, so in other words, when I replace this Orbicom, keep in mind the technology continues to get smaller and smaller. True. But when you really design a data center, what you really want to be able to do is leave all of your existing equipment up and in line, you want to come out to a line right here, you want to set up all of your new equipment, okay? And you want to get your new equipment online, beta tested, and ready to rock and roll 
because this is a 24 by 7 operation, you basically got to turn the power off to this system and turn the power on to this system and you got to be ready to roll. The planning of that and the scheduling of that is left, of course, to all of the agencies and CATS. Communication Advisory Technical Subcommittee starts looking at how that's going to happen, planning it through, working with all the agencies that are affected, and that's where it happens. It's going to happen in here. Okay? One of the other things that you did in your building of this building, if most of you know that we're here, you have a generator the size of this room in this building. So this room, this building is rock hard, and again, if we have a true disaster where power is lost, this room and that room and the EOC that you're meeting in today are self-sustaining on that generator. So we can continue to run business as usual. Somewhat limited, but we can run business as usual. I'm going to take a right now, go down the hallway. If you want to take a bathroom break, we're going to just head out to the radio tower shed. Are there any questions? Don't hesitate to ask. Why is the clock that nice? Battery's dead. I adjusted it yesterday. This is a fire stuff. Yeah. Well, see, that's what we're going to do. You know, there's a gap in there. Um, what you see in front of you here is, again, as we built the building, we um, had to move our mig we had to migrate from down at the old jail office. We had to migrate our central repository for Sturgeon Bay's communications out to here. And so, as you look up at this tower behind me, of course, it does it provide radio frequencies back and forth. But you'll see two big gray dishes up there as well. One of those gray dishes is pointed over to Brussels Hill. One of those gray dishes is pointed to Sunny Slope Road. Okay. So all that radio traffic that's going on, whether it's fire, EMS, um, or sheriff, or any of the other supporting agencies, is basically routed across those microwaves out to those various towers. In your bond issuance, the first two projects that you see at the top of the spreadsheet that's in the pr proposal today is to build basically two of these. One in the southeast corner of our county and one in the southwest. Okay. The one in the southwest at this time sounds like Kiwani County is willing to cost share with us because they could get radio signaling off of that tower in the southwest. In the southwest, we are looking at a site that the county already owns. In the southeast, the Melody Acres site, we do not own and we are in negotiations at this time with the property owner to either lease or buy that property to put up one of these towers. When you put up one of these towers, it is a piece of infrastructure that will last for years no less than 25 to 30, okay? It's not that we won't enhance what's on the tower during that period of time. We might change out the electronics, we might change out whatever, but the physical location, its height, for the most part, stays consistent through that 25, 30 year life cycle. So again, it does meet the bond requirements that are in front of you today for that. When you walk in here, again, we ask that you not walk behind, okay? We don't want you to bump in anything, but if you wanna walk in and see what's in these, or it's basically a lights out data center. Again, it's a self-sustaining situation where it has gas and a gas generator. If it does lose power, it continues to work. It has an uninterruptible power supply to take any type of electrical hits. If you look at that telephone pole back there, the new fiber that we're building with Cellcom underneath the bay is coming in off that pole and goes to this pole box right over here and in. And then we have 24 strands going into the building, goes out from the high I can tell you that Bay Electronics, Len Keenan, um, and everybody that was involved with getting this one spec spec'd out did a really good job. Are the other two towers planned to be like this, self-supporting without any guidewires? At, at this time, they look to be two 200-foot tries. Yes. How tall is this one here? I think this 120. This so is what would happen in the outlying towers. They send the signal here and then it goes here. Right, we have both transmit and receive off those towers. So we transmit out to those towers or page off, 
and then as that officer talks on his portable, it goes back to that tower down there and then comes here. Or the southeast corner would be either through Brussels or here. Southwest would be through Brussels. Back to here eventually. So in other words, down, down on Go ahead. Every ounce of communication for that building has to come through here to get in. Correct. At this time, every wireless communication every has to come in. There are some wired communications that can come in over other landlines. But what J it's a key point to understand what Jason just said is those towers in the south are going to hop to our high point. Everybody knows Brussels Hill in Door County. We have a tower on top of Brussels Hill. Our tower on Brussels Hill is an 80 or 100 foot tower. If you ever go past Brussels Hill, you'll see a big red and white tower. That is the state tower. State Department of Transportation, State Patrol maintains that. We have our microwave dishes on the state tower. So there's one of our collaborations. And as a result of that, our microwave hops to their tower, then goes over. We use a little wireless link and we repeat it off of our own tower on Brussels Hill. In the future, when we build these two towers in the south that are in the bond, both of those towers, or at least one of them, will come back to Brussels Hill and hop to here. So it's like a hopping situation. You'll also see in the bottom line, I have fiber initiatives for 50,000, because along the southern border, for those of you who were out at the CELCOM presentation, CELCOM is running fiber up and through the county to all of the base of their towers. So we have asked them, what would it cost to run some fiber to the base of our county-owned radio towers? So we're gonna look at that in the future as well. We would rely on fiber to carry our traffic and the microwave be the backup to that fiber. So that is still in, in, the, in the works down the road, 10 years out. So this tower went down. Do you have a backup that you can use or do you go into the fiber? If this tower goes down, that's why all the control stations that you saw in the MDF room, that's why all those control stations are there. They were, some of them were initially here and that was a thought that we came up with at, at a CATS committee meeting one time was, if something happened to this tower and we had all the control stations here, it would essentially lock the, the system down. By moving everything over there, you would still have a redundant with control stations to talk to vehicles. All right. Do you have to work through, I think it's Evans Engineering, when you site, when you find your locations we, for towers? Like, with, I just remember that. Right. RPC and the ordinance in Door County asks that you attempt to co-locate on existing towers. I mean, that's basically um, being a good neighbor in Door County, trying to keep the number of towers down. Um, we don't necessarily work through Evans. We've been working mostly with Len Keenan, and then with site surveys and just geographic using Tom Haight's GIS system, we look for those areas that have elevation already, natural elevation, so we don't have to build a, a taller tower to identify but what's really dictating our need is the fact that you don't have portable or coverage in the car at various locations. And again, when we talk about the geography of Door County, we all know, especially along the bay, think about those communities where you all drive down. I mean, radio coverage is line of sight in many cases, and, and that's the issue. So using Evans or not using Evans, um, some of the things that we have to follow along with when we work with the RPC is our height of our tower, close proximity to other parcel owners, all of that has to come into play. What, what's the difference? You have Melanie and you got the uh, quarry right across the street. What's the difference in elevation between the two? We estimated that it was about 60 feet. And so that's 60 feet of tower build that you have to put in there. And the other thing is, is that it's an active quarry. Um, or we've been told it's still an active quarry. And as a result of it being an active quarry, I don't know if you want to put a, something like this in the base of that. But it might have to be a fallback position. And again, that's where we're saying, although we expect that we could build a tower there for 435000 one just like this, on the Melody, that's with land acquisition included. Um, that's a swag. You know, if the landowner wants to sell, if he doesn't want to sell, now we have to take, and we have to stick it into maybe rather what we thought was a 200-foot tower, we might have to put into a 300-foot tower. Okay. Sounds like we have about three different meetings going on. It would be advantageous if everyone kind of listened up here so you don't have to go back and repeat. However, are we just about to the end of the yep. tour? At this point, if you want to just take a quick peek at what's inside of a typical radio tower, go ahead. And then we're going to go over to the ambulance next. I'll meet you at the ambulance.
Again, what we'll do is we're going to start with the discipline tours now. All right. So we're going to come in here. We're going to do the ambulance first. Then we're going to move to the sheriff and Sturgeon Bay PD. And the last tour will be of the fire trucks. So actually, we have multiple fire trucks here today. So I want you to go to your district's fire truck. Meet your uh, firemen and whatever. We're going to let each of the people introduce themselves and talk a little bit about how they use the communication system. So you need to come in a little bit, take a look at why it's imperative that they have their communications working in their vehicles, all right? I'm going to turn it over to Aaron, and he'll introduce himself and his staff. All right, good morning. Aaron LeClaire with Emergency Services. Um, paramedic, my partner Julie, with me today. Um, just real brief, we work in 24-hour shifts, so we're always on 365. Um, the way we're notified of a call is through our pagers. We wear these all the time, on duty, off duty, whatever the case may be. Um, when dispatch receives their call, it comes to us, it sounds something like this, if you can hear it, I don't know. This is actually a backup call, meaning they're looking for off-duty personnel to come in to cover a call. 640, per 680, we need a crew to stand by. They are en route to a head injury in North Ellison Bay. 640, we need a crew to stand by. So I got that at home last night. Um, I was unavailable, so I didn't go, but if I would, I'd use my portable. We're all issued portables. Looks just like this. Um, depending on where you are, where I live, I work off central EMS. Generally, I have okay communications from my house. Once I get tight to the lakeshore, not as well. If we're on duty and that call goes off, we use mainly our mobile radio in the squad. Um, generally don't have too many issues with that. If we do dispatch, let us know and we try it again. Um, at that point, we say we're en route. Dispatch may give us updates on the patient while we're en route. Sometimes our EMRs or fire departments at the scene will give us updates. That's where we start to run into a lot of problems because they're operating off portable radios. Uh, depending where they are in Egg Harbor, we have a lot of issues sometimes here in you guys. Um, Sevastopol along the shores at times, especially down south. Um, again, once we're on scene, we use a mobile radio. Dispatch normally can hear us very well. Once we're on scene, we switch back to our portables and that's where we can again run into problems of asking for additional resources, uh, whether it be more crews, helicopter, whatever the case may be. Um, and if we are asking for more help, it's normally not good. So it's very important that we get it rapidly. Um, from there, we begin our transport either 90% of the time back to Sturgeon Bay. Um, the driver will radio over the main channel, but then we have another radio system that we use um, to talk to the hospital, and that's a whole separate different system that, Carrie, I don't know, do you guys even copy that? Okay. So that's, we have a whole nother system in our squads that we use, and Chris, is that a UHF for the hospital? Yes, UHF. So it's a completely different system. Um, so, you know, like I said, the problems we have tend to be very critical to us, because it could be a first responder calling out at a car accident that they have six patients. We aren't capable of handling that with this rig. Six patients, we need at least two more ambulances. So that can cause quite a delay until a, a radio that has enough boost or whatever it may be. If we're in a bad area, there's no choice. You may have to switch to your cell phone. At that point in time, your cell phones are just as unreliable in a lot of cases, especially in this county, as you guys may be able to relate to that a little more. Um, but that tends to be our biggest when we're calling for more help off of portable is when we're, we need the help and we can't really be delayed at that point. And that's where we tend to have a lot of our issues. So, is that my three minutes? Do you all have any questions for me? Good job. Not sure. Heckler in the crowd. What's that? I did the tires this morning. Guys, guys, I'll come back and ask questions before we go back in, but just to keep it moving, let's get over to the sheriff's car and the police car, Sturgeon Bay PD. Let's get the group a little bit tighter so we can keep it kind of focused and going here. Why don't you guys come right in here on the back of the cop car? I'm sorry, police car. 
You want to look in the trunk? <laughs> As you notice with this car, everything is, the computer controls everything. Um, these deputies now rely on this computer. They're, they they communicate directly uh, with other deputies through this computer. They get all their, they can see the calls with this computer. Got a Here's all the current calls right there. This tells me where all the deputies are on the road right now in the city and county. When you get a fire call, the fire units will be listed here. Washington Island, but this tells the officer where exactly everybody is at any given time. When a call comes in, it will come up here what the nature of the call is. So then the deputy can see where that call is, the type of call, where is he going, um, who's being assigned to it. Does um, he get it audibly also? No. Um, I wish a call would come in. What he, just, there'll be a little beep, especially if it's assigned to you or it's updating. If I was on the road right now and they issued me a call, it would beep telling me that um, you know my screen has been updated because it affects me. I, I'm going to get that call. Um, but it also is really nice. Everybody's heard of tracks. Um, that's the, the citations now are all electronic. They do them right here in the car. Type them up, printer back here, they print them out, give them to the violator. Right here with the state system, he can run any plate, person, or anything right from his car. Whoever so before he ever approaches the car, he can already run, yep. can already run the plate. Yep. So, like, I don't know whose car that is right there, that 168, but he could type in 168 PCF, run it, and that will come back telling him everything. Years ago, you'd always have to tell dispatch, but now um, we don't need to go through dispatch, we go through the, the computer. The, the, the radio, though, um, we still notify dispatch where the vehicle's being stopped for safety reasons, um, the color of the vehicle, how many occupants are in the vehicle, our location, and then when the, the traffic stop is completed. Um, so I know that you're here today for concerning communications. There are spots in the county that, well, you, you guys probably even know the spots. Murphy Park is one. If you're below the bluffs, Fish Creek. Again, below the bluffs, you might as well forget your portables. County Union, down in the Breezy Acres area, well, your portables are just about, you know. Uh, so there is spots that throughout the county where 
um, the guys get familiar or recognize or realize they're not going to get out of their port. Then the same thing happens with the cell phones. Each deputy is issued a cell phone, and then there's there's spots they know they can't even get out with their cell phone. It's the time. But let's bring it in tight, real tight. No, tighter, tighter. Come on, come on in. We got everybody's attention. All right, Leo said I got to cut this off in about five to seven minutes. So what I'm asking that you do, okay, is we have three represented fire departments here. Is that correct, Chris? At least three, three or four. Three or four, okay. Pick your favorite fire truck and go talk to the guys. Let them introduce themselves. But we need you back in that room in seven minutes. Okay. <laughs> I need you back in that room in seven minutes. They got to know what you want for lunch. All right. Make this short sweep. A rescue truck used for all types of specialty rescues and on the fire ground. Um, but let's just take a couple examples of the use in this. There is the regular docking station for a laptop in this truck that runs off our radio system. In that laptop is a mapping system. So when we do search and rescue or if we do a, a water rescue, we can actually pull a map of that area up and coordinate our search patterns with it. Unfortunately, some of the worst areas for communications in Door County are on the water side, both the lake and the bay. So it renders us pretty much useless. One last example before you guys go in is uh, we had a water rescue out at Whitefish Bay a month or so ago. A jet ski, a kid fell off a jet ski. Report of a jet ski floating in the lake, no report of any person. We full complement, we respond out there, two boats, one from the city, um, our big boat that's docked and then we trailered our small boat out there. Uh, one of the sheriff's deputies went on to a third story of a home along the lake and looked out in the lake and it was rough, four to six footers that day, and just happened to see a hand. The jet ski wow. was about a half mile ahead of, of the person because the, the waves take the jet ski faster. Just happened to see a hand, could not contact us on the shore. Finally I got that information and I could not talk to either one of the boats. So these two boats are doing search patterns out there while this kid is in the water and we have just no way of, of talking to him. So, you know, typically a uh, glidden drive, hitching post area is absolutely horrible on communications. And uh, fortunately we pulled this guy out, his core temperature was 88 degrees. Um, had he not had a life jacket on, you know, he'd have been gone, but we could you know, it's really frustrating standing on shore telling them, you know, there go that is. way, go that oh, way. And, yeah, and of yeah. course, out in the water, they couldn't see anything because of the waves. So. Will this new system solve those? Absolutely. It will improve it. Nothing will ever be solved because of our some of our geographical issues. But I always tell people, uh, think of all the times on your cell phones that you lose a call or you can't get. That's what our radio system is. And when it's an emergency, that's big time for us. And unfortunately, that's times we use our radios.